So, thank you for coming. Uh, what I'm going to present today is a uh, updated version, actually, of a presentation that I also gave uh, previously at B-Sides in Las Vegas. So, I'm going to be talking today, of course, about penetration testing, but also about chat ops. Who here knows what chat ops is? Raise your hand. Okay. About half the people. Good. Well, you'll know what it is uh, by the time this presentation is finished. So, let's see, how do I actually change the slide? Yeah. Oh, that works. Great. So, uh, we're going to start with the question, what is chat ops? So, chat ops is a concept that I, well, mostly gratuitous sto gratuitously stole from the company GitHub. So, we all know and love GitHub, of course. They created a chatbot called Hubot. So, who here has ever used Hubot? Raise your hand. Okay, smaller number of hands. So, Hubot is an open source project, and it's a chatbot. It's basically very similar to like an old school IRC bot, you know. Uh, so, uh, except for the fact that it tends to run in more modern uh, chat rooms. So, uh, I'm sure most of you here probably use Slack or something similar. Raise your hand if you use something similar to Slack. Okay. So at Radically Open Security, we use a open source self-hosted version of Slack called Rocket Chat. Who here has ever heard of Rocket Chat? Yeah. All right. I highly recommend it, by the way. Uh, you know, uh, I, I don't really trust Slack. You know, it's probably only a matter of time before they're acquired by some Google, Facebook, whatever, you know. Uh, and of course, there is no cloud. There only is other people's computers. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, yeah, so, and especially when you're dealing with customers' pen test data, I can tell you that I don't trust that kind of stuff uh, to Slack's uh, cloud, and to be quite honest, I don't think you should either. But that being said, um, so we use uh, Rocket Chat, and uh, this is basically a uh, screenshot, sorry, it's a little bit fuzzy, uh, with the projector, but uh, this is a screenshot of... Uh, what our chat room looks like with uh, with Rocket Chat, and yeah, can you guys make this a little sharper by any chance? No, it is what it is. Okay, if you were able to read this text, <laughs> what you would see is that uh, I typed in a command called Rossbot Pug Me. Okay, so Rossbot is the name of our chatbot. So Rossbot for radically open security. Okay, and Pug Me. Okay, so this is an example of one command that we can do using our chatbot. So these chat commands essentially are providing any number of different commands that you can carry out as a penetration tester. Pug me, of course, is like one of the most useless commands that exists. You type in Rossbot pug me and you get back a pug. Yeah, I mean, not really useful, but definitely, you know, for, for sort of like cultural development of your company, this kind of stuff is great. At one point in time, I think we installed the uh, Cards Against Humanity. But anyway, so, uh, yeah. So, but, but the truth is, there's a whole lot of far more useful commands that we also can do uh, via the chatbot. And essentially what you're doing with chat ops is you are actually turning your chat room into a kind of command line. I mean, kind of like a Unix command line. So it's like making the chat your command and control center for your entire pen testing operations. And that is a super powerful thing. Which then brings us uh, into uh, the actual description of pen testing chat ops. And again, my apologies for, I have never seen the quality this horrible ever. <laughs> but uh, I'll have to explain basically what's on here. So if you were able to read this, what you would see is you would see that I am compiling a PDF of a penetration test report. So, you know, reporting, it's a necessary evil Developers hate it, pen testers hate it, pretty much everybody hates it. And uh, like every pen testing company in the universe, we have developed a uh, framework to essentially automate all of the most boring bits away. So uh, it is worth mentioning that we have open sourced our uh, entire framework uh, for everything I'm describing today, by the way. And not only have we open sourced it, but we have made it an OWASP project. So if you Google it uh, or DuckDuckGo it or whatnot, uh, look for OWASP pen text. So this is the system uh, that I'm talking about. So, but what we do is uh, that, uh, 
the the core of it really is a uh, pen test documentation uh, automation framework. So we're taking XML uh, templates and compiling them using XSLT style sheets into pretty PDFs, which then, of course, we can deliver to our customers, and hopefully, they're gonna they're gonna love. Um, the way that we do it is basically I use Rossbot, I use our chatbot to be able to uh, actually execute the command to compile the report. So if you were able to see this, um, well, actually, uh, I think in this example, it's a little fuzzy. I, I can't read it either, but it looks like we're actually compiling a quotation, not a, not a report. But uh, I believe that it says uh, Rossbot Quickscope off dot, uh, well, basically customer name. And so what happens is first we fill in, so if we're, we're creating quotations for our customers, we fill in an A4's worth of XML, then we do this quick scope, and then that expands the A4's worth of XML into a longer XML file containing all the boilerplate, you know, and all the stuff that we would need. The next command that I'm uh, uh, doing via the chatbot is I am uh, saying rawspot build quote, and again, OFF dash customer name. OFF, yeah, I apologize, we're a Dutch company. The Dutch word for uh, quotation is offerta. We never really got that uh, out of uh, out of our system. But uh, but basically, uh, that's sort of the, the, the naming scheme we use internally for distinguishing uh, quotations from uh, pen, tests, pen test reports. Nonetheless, this build command at that point is invoking the entire backend tool chain that then is uh, taking that XML file compiling it using the style sheets, and then essentially spitting out a clickable link to a PDF file. And again, sorry, it's not readable, but what you can see is that blue line that's kind of fuzzy there, that actually is a clickable URL to the PDF file. Now, the really nice thing is everybody in this chat room can essentially see you know, that PDF uh, link that was just uh, clicked out, that, that was just spit out by the chatbot, so basically, you know, a command invoked by one member of our pen testing staff also can be viewed by everybody else uh, who happens to be in that chat room. So now is a good time to mention that at Radically Open Security, we have a really unusual way of pen testing that we call peek over our shoulder. So what this is, uh, I in the past have railed a little bit against the lack of uh, openness and transparency in the pen testing process, uh, usually perpetrated by big commercial companies. So I, I tried to come up with a, a new workflow for pen testing that really tried to involve the customer more and to optimize for knowledge transfer. So what we do at Radically Open Security is we actually invite the customers to join us in the chat rooms. So this is actually really ki kind of interesting because uh, while well, we radically open security, we happen to be a 100% online company, okay? So all of my staff works remotely. I have a critical mass of staff in the Netherlands, of course, because we started in Amsterdam, but I've also got a lot of German hackers, for example, CCC, of course. But we've also got penetration testers in Australia. We've also got pen testers in India. We've also got pen testers in Latin America. Uh, I just hired recently some people in uh, South Africa. So, I mean, when we say we are a global team, we really are a global team. However, uh, this actually has uh, advantages. And what this means is that all of the communication of all of my team members happens via this chat room. So essentially, the chat room is our office. But then what we do is we invite customers to join us in our chat rooms. So what that means is it's basically inviting the customers into our office. <laughs> so then during the course of an engagement, the customers can overhear every single conversation that our penetration testers are having throughout the course of an engagement. Needless to say, they love this. <laughs> the other thing also is when we're making use of uh, chat ops commands via the chat bot, they can also see this too. So if one of my penetration testers uh, uses the uh, raw spot build command and we get a PDF link uh, for a, for a uh, pen test report spit out, the customer can immediately click on it. So this is really powerful. So what it does is it really assists with making a very tight and fast feedback loop with your customers. 
which of course uh, has a number of uh, really great advantages. So, uh, yeah, so pen text itself, I mean, you can basically find uh, bits of it in uh, GitLab, or sorry, in GitHub. Uh, also, m more recently, we have uh, also uh, put a lot of our chatbot code into GitLab. Uh, this has also been because we've been integrating it with uh, GitLab uh, CI, because we're actually in the middle right now of doing a big DevOps uh, refactoring on our code uh, to try and make it easier to deploy with uh, containerization and everything. But uh, there's documentation. That if you were able to read this, you would see that this is uh, what the uh, an example of what an XML template looks like. It then compiles via the chatbot into something that looks like a bug standard pen test report, <laughs> pretty much. Uh, but of course, because this is open source, you can basically take this, adopt it yourself, steal it. That's what open source is for. Replace the logo, uh, replace the company name, and you too can use it for generating your own uh, pen test reports automatically. Um. Oh man, this is hard to read. So, this looks like the same slide as before. All right. So, we internally use uh, GitLab. Uh, this, so we kind of have a, a bit of a, a trifecta of software that we tend to use uh, within uh, radically open security. So, we have uh, Rocket Chat. Uh, we have GitLab. And then uh, we also have, uh, well, basically uh, all the bits uh, with the uh, with the chatbot. We used to use uh, Canboard for uh, project management uh, purposes, but at a certain point actually phased it out because, well, people didn't like clicking. Sorry, like cultural quirk of my company. Nobody wants to take their hands off the keyboard, but uh, <laughs> you get that with hackers. Uh, but in either case, so we're doing the majority of that uh, actually via the command line now as well. But this is uh, an example of how the uh, structure of the pen test report looks uh, in GitLab. The, the workflow that we have actually is that the pen testers document uh, the findings, but also the, the notes in GitLab. So we use GitLab issues. So every time uh, a penetration tester updates an issue in GitLab, for example, saying, you know, we just tried this and this and this, or otherwise, if they are pushing, for example, let's say they ran some scan and uh, they're pushing the, the file with the scan results into the repository, every single time this GitLab repository is updated, the chatbot uh, spits out a update in the chat room that says, this pen tester just did this at this timestamp. Click here for more information. This is also really nice for the customers. <laughs> you know, because what it is, is actually without any extra work on the pen tester's part, we're actually giving the customer a kind of blow by blow <laughs> update on exactly what our pen testers are doing at any moment in time. And again, like a well-informed customer tends to be a happy customer. There's other really nice things, by the way, about including your customers in the process in this way, shape, and form. You know, for the purposes of uh, crystal box pen testing, this is super efficient because essentially a lot of people tend to ask the question, yeah, but isn't having the customer in your chat room annoying? Like, aren't they always asking questions and getting in your way and, you know, requiring too much explanation? Yeah, I get this question a lot. But the truth of the matter is, it's actually annoying for us not having an active customer there. <laughs> and the reason why is because basically the customer is an oracle for us. So anytime we have questions, like for example, what does this function do? Or, you know, why is this code path like this? Or, you know, we, we just did something, did it create a file on your server? Can you check? Or are you using a complex password here? So, you know, we want to know if it's worth r running the password cracker on this. You know, having the customer there actually is really, really nice. You know, other things like can you reboot the server or we're having problems getting this to compile? And basically what we do is we invite the customer to invite actually as many developers, sysadmins, and DevOps folks, basically anybody involved with the product or service that we're testing, to actually join us in the chat room to sort of, you know, join the party. For us, it doesn't even matter. So it, for us, it's kind of like, you know, the more the merrier. There is OPSEC, of course, <laughs> which uh, I'll, I'll get to uh, a bit later. But uh, but nonetheless, for us, I mean, operationally speaking, it's not more difficult for us having 10 people in the chat room than it is having two people. Another thing that it also enables us to do is uh, allow the customers even sometimes to 
uh, invite their vendors to join us, surprisingly enough. <laughs> um, and this would sound like a really odd thing, like why would you want the vendors in your chat room while you're doing a pen test? But if it turns out actually that the vendor is involved with either hosting or building whatever the thing is that you're testing, it actually is super useful because, again, it's like a second set of oracles that you have in the chat room. On top of this, it actually helps to improve the relationship between the customer and the vendor, strangely enough, because they're kind of working together and collaborating uh, on this. And also, from the point of view of a pen test company, uh, this is also beneficial because I have to say, sometimes those th those vendors who got invited to work uh, with a peek over our shoulder actually became direct customers of ours later, <laughs> just because they uh, saw what we were doing and liked the workflow so much uh, that they decided they wanted to try us so for their own pen test next time. So there's a whole lot of uh, win, really, in doing things this way. Um, so... What you have here is a, it's a screenshot from a GitHub repository of another open source tool that we built uh, that was called the Passive Scanning Tool. So this uh, was a uh, tool that we had built uh, as an assignment for uh, SIDN, which is the uh, uh, company that owns uh, the .nl uh, TLD. And uh, I'm allowed to talk about this because the report is published. But we wrote essentially a tool that took the output of uh, Shodan and... Uh, Scans.io and uh, I think one other thing, and basically uh, bundled uh, all of these, uh, well, the output together and just uh, spit it out in a concise way so we could do uh, passive scanning. So this tool also has been open sourced. Uh, but the interesting part about this is this tool then also can be integrated into the chatbot. So this is actually really nice because you can actually start taking a lot of the different kinds of tools that you use frequently and then starting to slowly integrate that, you know, uh, into this kind of like single uh, command line. So, you know, what other kinds of things actually can we do using the chatbot? So another formula that we really, really enjoy doing uh, with our customers is what we call a red-blue pen test. So what we do is we take a group of developers, so software developers, system administrators, and DevOps folks, okay? So let's say we have a dozen of them. What we do is we gamify their pen test, and we actually split them into two teams. So we'll have, say, either a red team and a blue team of, say, six and six people, or we can also do it with a red team and a red team. What then happens is these two uh, teams compete on hacking their own stuff. And what we have done is we have actually created our own scoreboard application so that at the end of every day of this kind of, you know, CTF competition where they're hacking their own products, then you can see, for example, and, and sorry, again, this is fuzzy, but right here I typed in a command called good job blue. And then raw spot then at that point says incremented blue 24 points and then it spits out some motivational image, which, of course, geeks love. <laughs> um, but, I mean, it really allows us, you know, in the same integrated command line to be able to put actually all kinds of applications, you know, that we might need for all different kinds of uh, assignments uh, with our customers. So this, uh, this all is, uh, is really super cool. The nice thing, by the way, about the red-blue pen tests is uh, it really takes the developers out of their usual position of developing for, you know, a few days to a week. And they're really looking at their own stuff from the eyes of an attacker. The number one comment that we get after doing red-blue pen tests is, and I quote, I will never look at code the same way again. And this is why we do it. So... What other kinds of things, actually, can we integrate into this single unified command line? Well, it turns out there's a whole lot of different things. I mean, start by thinking about scanning tools. Like, take Nmap, for example. Nmap uh, is handy in the sense that uh, it, al it allows us to uh, get output from the tool in XML format. That actually is a really easy, for w easy one for us, because if we're then using XML for our pen test reports themselves, then integrating bits of XML directly from our scanning tools actually helps us, you know, to, to make things quite a bit faster and quite a bit more efficient. So this, uh, this much we already have integrated, uh, into, into, uh, raw spot. 
Other scanning tools uh, that uh, possibly could be uh, integrated, uh, well, still, right now we're still using it by hand, but we could, is essentially things like W3AF, uh, SQL map, essentially any kinds of scanning tools that you might run uh, on some kind of uh, infrastructure. Uh, Hydra, so uh, brute forcing. Yeah, I mean, this is another thing also that we can invoke uh, via the command line. And why not? Uh, reconnaissance, so things like uh, who is Google, pass uh, the passive scanning tool I told you about before. I mean, we've also got DuckDuckGo implemented in that. I think at one point we put, uh, can I Google that for you in there? Anyway. Um, other things like uh, hash cracking. Now, this is super cool. What we've done is we have actually built some rainbow tables and uh, put the rainbow tables on our backend server. The nice thing is we can actually uh, invoke uh, a hash cracker that makes use of these rainbow tables, and we can invoke this via the chat. How cool is that? But another really nice thing about this is because we're using uh, a web front end for this, basically it means that I can use this full set of hacking tools that we have available essentially with any kind of device that has a web browser. So what that means is if, for example, I'm sitting in a bus, you know, traveling to some godforsaken corner of the country that I live in, um, what I can do is I can actually take out my cell phone and I can actually launch, you know, I, I can basically crack somebody's password using rainbow tables from my cell phone. How cool is that? <laughs> You know, and it actually really helps, I mean, for, for being efficient. Because, uh, I mean, of course, there's auth. <laughs> there has to be. There's multiple layers of auth. <laughs> you know, and this is another thing that we, uh, that we take seriously and we have to. But, uh, what it does mean is basically, you know, it makes, it allows you to be really flexible with the form factors of the device that you're using. Another nice thing also is that it makes system administration of the tool set really, really easy. Because basically there is uh, a single server that is running the necessary tools that we need uh, for Rossbot. And then um, let's say you, you hire a new pen tester and you have to onboard this new staff member. So with uh, most uh, companies, uh, you know, on, on day one, you know, the first thing is always, you know, issuing new laptops and, you know, <laughs> trying to get all the accounts set up and things like that. Well, for us, it's actually far easier because all we really have to do is arrange uh, that they have uh, off, you know, basically to be able to get in. And at that point, everything is set up, right? <laughs> so it actually makes onboarding new folks super easy. Um, you know, s similarly also, uh, with customers, uh, again, I, am talking about auth quite a lot, but, but do keep in mind that because a lot of these commands are there and a lot of these commands are powerful, we also, uh, have basically access control lists that control which user accounts are actually able to do which commands. Because, of course, uh, we don't want our customers running you know, hash cracking <laughs> tools, you know, via our command line. And trust me, like, a lot of customers that uh, we onboard, I mean, the first thing that they do is they try and hack us or they try and doing do, doing something that they uh, <laughs> that they're not supposed to do, which is great because if it's if they succeed, I'd probably be happy to give them a discount on their pen test. So uh, <laughs> that is to be encouraged. But uh, yeah, so uh, so that that is uh, quite interesting. Another thing also is with spear phishing. So this is something else that we can do uh, using chat ops that I think is really quite unique. So if we have um, a spear, well, not spear phishing, but a, a general purpose uh, phishing assignment, we have actually built a toolkit that, by the way, we have also open sourced. Um, and with a, one particular chat, uh, chat bot command, what we can do is we can actually take either, uh, you know, like a mailing list, like a text file or a web page. We can actually scrape it and then we can instrument those links automatically to basically point to, uh, our web server. <laughs> and then, uh, from there, we use, uh, the Slack API to basically take the hits on our, uh, on our web server and then inject that basically in to our chat so that uh, the Hubot then can basically say, this email address just clicked on this pretext name at this timestamp. 
And that is super cool. Because again, we invite the customers to be in our chat room. So what happens is we, you know, we can have like multiple security officers uh, from a particular customer sitting in our chat room. And they can sit there and watch while their own staff is getting fished in real time. You know, and we can also do exactly the same with, uh, for example, uh, web forms. So if we create, let's say, a, a fake, uh, I don't know, Windows 365 login, and we're basically just trying to uh, collect the uh, names and passwords that people are uh, silly enough to fill in, <laughs> um, the, the security officers can actually sit there and watch while people are filling things in. And sometimes, actually, this is really quite entertaining. Um, there was one particular time where we were doing a phishing assignment for a hosting provider. And at a certain point, uh, one of the software developers from the hosting provider figured out that the domain name we were using wasn't exactly right. <laughs> so at a certain point, he started playing with the form. So we, we started like, you know, seeing in the chat room, you know, all, all sort of str strange things happening. So at a certain point, it's just sort of like username, you know, nice try assholes. <laughs> <laughs> password, whatever, you know, <laughs> and, and, and my personal favorite was he, I think it was username, woohoo, password, SQL injection. <laughs> so, you know, this was actually really entertaining to watch. I mean, of course, that begs the question, was this guy in a sandbox environment while he was doing this? <laughs> but <laughs> still, uh, you know, at, at which point the security officers were just like, man, lunchtime, but thanks for the good entertainment. <laughs> so. Yeah, so, so this stuff is really cool. So the nice thing, again, with chat ops is not just that, you know, it centralizes all the tools that you're using, but it actually allows you to kind of innovate new experiences, you know, that your customers can have, which is, I think, pretty cool. So, uh, you know, also uh, for internal stuff, uh, we also have hooks uh, into our chat system. So, um, you know, like every company in the universe, uh, we have project management. I mean, you know, by now we're actually quite a large uh, company. You know, I've got about 40 staff members. We've had about 80 customers. Uh, I, now is a good t time to mention that we actually are a preferred supplier for uh, Google. Uh, also for uh, Mozilla uh, in the MOSS program. If you guys know, we do a lot of open source uh, audits uh, for that. Open Tech Fund, but also, you know, banks, insurance companies, hosting providers, telcos, etc. cetera. Um, but that's not the point. The point is, uh, because we have so much going on, uh, we have project management tools that we need um, for managing that. The problem with project management tools is if you expect the pen testers to actually do anything, <laughs> good luck with that. I mean, pen testers are lazy. So if you basically say, you know, when you're done, could you please, you know, move the you know, uh, item on the can board, you know, from this to done. I mean, if you ask your pen testers to do it, they just won't do it because that's pen testers. Um, <laughs> but instead, what you can do is uh, you can try and get them to update stuff uh, sort of by side effect. So we use this particular chat command uh, that is called um, raw spot ship it. So who here knows what the ship it squirrel is? Raise your hand. One person. Okay. Two people. Okay. So basically, this is another one of these incredibly useless uh, commands <laughs> that uh, uh, Hubot makes available. You, what you do is you put in the chat command, uh, ship it, basically anywhere in your, uh, in your chat, you know, and then you submit it. And then it spits out a squirrel, like a picture of a squirrel. So it's kind of useless, but uh, but it's like really cute squirrels. And sometimes they're wearing armor and sometimes they're on boats and like, you know, it's anyway. Maybe they're sometimes they're in a tree. But geeks like this, you know, because essentially if you're shipping, say, a pen test report or a quotation, I mean, it's nice to have some kind of little ritual for being able to celebrate victories, right? You know, that, that's good for the morale of your company. But we've rigged it as such that when people type in raw spot, ship it, and they get the squirrel, it automatically takes that can board item and it moves it to done. See, that's, that's a way to get, like, p lazy pen testers to do stuff. So uh, <laughs> just to kind of make it fun. So, you know, so this is actually really nice. Uh, we've also got uh, our own uh, support desk software that we've developed ourselves uh, called uh, Git Notes. So, uh, again, we, we tend not to use drag and drop uh, too much within the company just because our 
you know, we, we've tried it. Trust me, we've tried a lot of different open source uh, software packages. We throw a lot of things against the wall to see what sticks. And anything where people have to take their hands off the keyboard almost never sticks. <laughs> so um, basically, uh, we came up with our own uh, support desk software that uh, works entirely via the chat. So what happens is uh, we have magic email addresses uh, that tend to be, you know, things like, you know, uh, project name slash, uh, well, customer name slash project name at magical email address. And then what happens is um, that, so the chat bot at that point spits out an announcement of when new emails arrive that contain that uh, magical uh, email address. So what happens is the a copy of that email is uh, automatically put into the GitLab repository that corresponds to that particular assignment. And then Hubot says, you know, an email with from this sender with this subject name uh, just arrived at this timestamp. Please click here to see it. This is actually really handy because uh, sometimes we work with customers on multiple projects. And their security officers want us to keep them abreast of the uh, correspondence that we're having with our project teams. So what's really nice about this is as long as this uh, magical email address is being CC'd or BCC'd, then again, automatically, we're going to get these announcements in the channel. So as long as the security officers are um, in, basically in, in those channels, you know, that, that are involved with their own company, and to be honest, we've also written scripts to automatically add, you know, these security officers to every new chat room that uh, is created that is for their particular company then basically we can keep them completely abreast on the correspondence that's happening without a single bit of extra work. This is really nice. So again, this is sort of the power of what you can do uh, with, uh, with chat ops. We've also got another command that's called a uh, raw spot charge. So, okay, as a consultancy company, the bane of like every security consultant is declaring their hours. You know, everybody hates this. We've tried to make it as painless as possible. So what we do is we created this command called raw spot charge. So a particular pen tester can just say raw spot charge n, you know, for the number of hours, and then a really brief one line description of what they just did. Then raw spot says, you know, thank you, name of pen tester. You had just charged n hours with this description. You now have, uh, you know, m minus n hours less left in this pen test that that is like you know this percent of the pen test and then like a progress bar you know showing like the percent that's left in the pen test now that is super handy because uh it actually allows us in the course of the pen test as people are declaring their hours to actually see how much time is remaining and of course one of the challenges of working on pen tests is of course scoping and while you're doing the work, trying to stay within the scope. <laughs> and this is actually really nice. And also from the, the point of view of the customers, they also really like this way of doing it because it gives them transparency into seeing exactly where their money is going. Because, you know, in security consultancy, time is money. So if they can see exactly where the time is going, then they know exactly what they're paying for. So customers really, really appreciate this kind of transparency. Another thing that's really nice about it is let's say you, you scoped wrong. You know, that happens sometimes, you know. <laughs> I mean, we've gotten better with scoping, but we still make some errors sometimes. What it means is if there is a scoping error, the customers can see it coming from like two miles away. <laughs> so what that means is uh, around the 50% uh, point of the test, you can then say, well, you know, dear customer, we've just reached the 50% point of this pen test. You know, we've done X, Y, Z that, you know, was in our quotation, but, you know, there's still ABC left to, left to do. We don't think it's going to fit into the remaining time. So dear customer, can you please help us to prioritize so we can make sure that out of A, and B, A, B, and C that you can help us select which of these things are most important, uh, you know, and then the rest can get put in as future work. Now, customers really like this because A, it eliminates the uh, surprise factor, <laughs> you know, and, and one of the easiest ways to upset your customers is to have, well, unpleasant surprises, <laughs> you know, and, and really the more openness and transparency you have, the more they see these kinds of unpleasant surprises coming. So this is uh, actually really uh, practical and useful for uh, expectation management. Uh, they also It also gives the customer some knobs to turn, you know, on making some decisions about what to prioritize. And this is another thing that uh, tends to make customers really quite happy. 
So, you know, other things that we have uh, integrated into our chat system are things like uh, role-based access control. So uh, we do uh, have uh, particular uh, teams and particular roles. So our company is managed uh, in a decentralized fashion. Uh, we use a system that is somewhat similar to uh, Holacracy. I don't know if any of you guys are familiar with Holacracy, but it's a kind of decentralized management methodology that tends to work with uh, roles and circles. Uh, anyway, so uh, the circles that we would have, you know, in the holocratic view of, uh, of decentralized management translate into roles in our RBAC system. So, you know, th that's basically how it's handled. So, and of course, we create uh, tiger teams for individual assignments, uh, but there's also larger, more perpetual teams uh, that uh, are, you know, for example, like the pen tester team and the uh, project management team and the IT and infrastructure team. So, and this all translates into our back. And this also is how we stop, you know, customers from uh, being able to uh, run scans against their competitors or something using our infra. So, uh, other things, error logs. So, what's really nice is uh, we can actually, we've got a chat room that uh, tails the error logs. We've also got a chat, uh, another chat room that tails uh, debug logs on things. And what this means is that it allows people on our infra team to be able to debug stuff without needing shell on the server. Yay. <laughs> you know, so this kind of thing is also uh, really quite handy. Um, of course, with all these uh, chat commands, uh, you, you, well, it's a lot to keep straight in your head, so we also built a uh, sort of a help menu system <laughs> uh, so that our pen testers, if they want to know what commands are available, you know, a little bit like Unix man pages uh, to sort of help them uh, through, you know, knowing what commands uh, you do what and, and what the syntax is. So we've also built a system for that. You know, and then ultimately sort of, I think the sky is the limit with what you can do with these chatbots. You know, there is research at some point that I would be sort of curious in doing. And, and there are questions like, for example, you know, could you use, could you create AI chatbots? You know, and could these AI chatbots perhaps help with things like, uh, you know, answering frequently asked questions for people or, you know, helping, uh, you know, like if you're onboarding new staff members, you know, that kind of thing, uh, possibly. So, you know, this is the kind of thing, I mean, I don't want to pump a whole lot of money into this research, uh, you know, because it's not operational, uh, of course, from a, a company perspective. But I think uh, this is, a, this kind of stuff is very interesting, like projects, like master's thesis projects for AI students and things like that. So, uh, so that's pretty cool. Um, yeah. And other things like, uh, can we use, uh, AI chatbots for, for example, satisfaction surveys? <laughs> and of course, satisfaction surveys in general are really incredibly annoying. You know, I tend to get them, you know, via email and I almost always ignore them. But the nice thing is, uh, using chat ops, you can sort of mix the, routine and, and kind of like th method, methodologicalness, you know, of having a bot with the actual human touch of having humans there. So for example, if you were to use a chat bot to say, hey, customer, you know, are you satisfied with, you know, <laughs> with whatever uh, service you just got, you know, and then basically one through five or something like that. If it turns out then that the customer gave you a one because they're really not that happy, instead of, you know, the chat bot, or, you know, just basically keeping that and they're only interfacing with a machine, you're going to have live humans in the channel. So if, the, if you see a response that surprises you and that requires more clarification, then an actual human can sit there and ask questions, you know, as opposed to their interfacing with a uh, automated system. You know, you perhaps could also use a similar system for things like also, uh, you know, satisfaction surveys for the staff that you work with. Like, are you happy? You know, I mean, this kind of stuff is also uh, useful. To be fair, we haven't implemented this yet. I mean, this is future work, but I mean, this is uh, what I see as being some of the promise uh, of uh, AI chatbots. I'm sure there's more that you can do with this. You know, the sky's the limit, but this is research. And I think the more of us adopt this uh, workflow, you know, the more innov innovations we make and hopefully we can then open source all the innovations that we create. So it turns out actually that uh, our workflow is quite innovative. Uh, actually, my company is also quite innovative. We have a, uh, a, a bit of a strange um, 
business model. We are, we're also a social enterprise, uh, which is worth saying. Uh, and I set up Radically Open Security also as a nonprofit company. <laughs> this requires more explanation. And to be honest, that's a whole different talk that I'm not going to give today. But uh, we have won a whole bunch of awards, actually, for our company and for the uh, way that we work, uh, including this uh, open and transparent workflow. So uh, the Dutch Chamber of Commerce called Radically Open Security the 50th most innovative uh, SME in the Netherlands. Um, you know, also, uh, we, uh, yeah, have been involved with other, our pen testers, one of them won the Pony Award at uh, Black Hat uh, for his uh, research. Um, also, we created a uh, NetAid kit uh, project, which was basically a nonprofit, uh, completely open source Tor and open VPN router for journalists and activists that we built together with Free Press Unlimited. So that won some awards from the ISOC and from the uh, Internet Freedom Festival. Um, and also, uh, I won an award from uh, CIO Magazine uh, calling me the most innovative IT leader in the Netherlands. <laughs> So anyway, it's not about me, but it's, I think, more rather about the ideas. So, you know, I, I believe that uh, what we're doing right now with, uh, with chat ops, I mean, this is really kind of a new innovation with penetration testing. Uh, it's also, I believe, an innovation that uh, can also assist you guys and help you all raise the bar to do more open and transparent p pen testing, which I think ultimately will help you guys uh, to also improve the relations with your own customers and also allow you to have better pen testing services. I think also this uh, chat ops is not only useful for uh, pen testing. I know actually hosting providers, believe it or not, who have uh, done trials with uh, our, uh, our uh, pen text system and also had really good feedback uh, from their customers, uh, you know, for using hosting uh, services uh, with chat ops. And believe it or not, we even got approached by uh, one of the Dutch ministries talking about if they can use chat ops in a pilot for open government. <laughs> so I think that there's actually a whole lot of really cool <laughs> and different stuff that we can do with chat ops, uh, you know, and it's just up to us to sort of explore the space and, uh, and try it. Anyway, uh, I am out of time, so I think I'm going to wrap it up here. Uh, so uh, I'm happy to take any questions at this point. Thank you very, very much. Um, it sounds like the chatbot can do a lot of things, and so it must have permissions all over your system. Apart from your access control list that you mentioned, is there anything else that you have to do to make this safe? Yes, good question. So indeed, uh, it is allowing the uh, chatbot to do a whole lot of stuff, and uh, indeed we have uh, been thinking uh, quite critically about the actual backend ar architecture of this system. So. I mentioned before that we're in the middle right now of this big uh, DevOps refactoring, and a whole lot of that involves containerization. So in the refactoring that we're doing right now, we're busy actually uh, trying to create an individualized container uh, basically for each uh, customer, and ultimately an individualized uh, container for each assignment. So basically, uh, if uh, all of this is uh, then running in its own uh, virtual machine, uh, basically, if there is a breach of some kind, then it would actually only uh, give access then to the to the VM that uh, you know this particular assignment is uh, is running in. So yes, we've thought of this, <laughs> and uh, this is uh, basically another way that uh, we're trying to uh, isolate things. Um, there are still, of course, ways that uh, you would need to. Uh, federate this stuff, I mean, especially uh, authentication-wise. So, I mean, this is uh, definitely a work in progress on our side, but this is definitely why we're going the DevOps route, <laughs> you know, with a lot of this stuff, because really what we want is we want to uh, create these containers, and then when an assignment is over, uh, we want to destroy them again. 
You know, and this is sort of another OPSEC thing. What I really want, I'm not going to say that it's happening as much as I want it, but this is the direction I want to move in, is that once we uh, deliver an assignment for a customer, what I would want to do is uh, we've, we already have a raw spot command that can take the uh, rocket chat transcript and then make a text file of that and then check that into the corresponding GitLab repository. What I then want to do is we can basically get a tarball of that GitLab repository. And then what I can do is I can give that to the customer. And then I can say, dear customer, I don't want this on my server. <laughs> Take this tarball. And if you keep it, you're responsible for it. You know, I don't want it, <laughs> you know, but, but you take this tarball. And if you ever want us to do a retest, then you can basically give us that tarball back later. And then we can reconstitute the container basically using the tarball. <laughs> and then at that point, then we have what we need to be able to uh, offer you uh, retests and things like that in the future. So that's basically another um, sort of OPSEC thing uh, that we're doing. We also, of course, uh, do regular pe regular pen testing. Uh, on our own infrastructure, and I can't tell you, I'm probably not even allowed to tell you how many zero days we've found <laughs> in Rocket Chat and the associated software. What I can say, though, is actually they've been quite responsive and quick about uh, fixing them uh, once we've reported them. And in fact, they became so enthusiastic with our reporting them that Rocket Chat eventually just hired us as their security vendor <laughs> so we could just pen test for them directly. So uh, that's pretty cool uh, also. Um, you know, is the security of this perfect? No, of course not. I mean, but, you know, we're dealing with complex software here. I mean, also web-based software. So, uh, you know, we're like any other uh, company in the universe. We, too, of course, are also making uh, trade-offs, uh, OPSEC-wise. Uh, you know, it's a constant process. We're constantly trying to refactor and raise the bar. But, uh, you know, like any other system, I mean, I, I obviously can't pretend that it's perfect either because, well, no software is. So, thank you. Any more questions? Oh, that was very interesting. Thank you. Uh, I have two questions, uh, actually. So first is, uh, I can see the value of having people from the uh, company that's being pen tested and from having a lot of those people to answer your question and stuff like this. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, like, uh, answering and checking things for you obviously takes time. I'm not saying this is a wasted time, but uh, how do you deal with that? Uh, do you do you, uh, is there in the contract uh, some kind of an appointment of people who are supposed to help you, or you are just uh, hoping that people will be uh, helpful? Yeah. Good, good question. So the question is, uh, do all customers actually want to take advantage of the peak over our shoulder, given that it might be time consuming? So the answer is no, not all customers want it. And they're not required to do it either. So basically, it is a free additional service that we provide in the course of our normal pen testing. If they want to take advantage of it, we're super appreciative and we definitely encourage it. If they say, we don't care, we're not interested, we just want to report in a black box, you can completely, you know, <laughs> t take this off our hands, we don't want to see it, we can do that for them too. I mean, it's not our preferred way of working, but some customers are like that. Uh, so, uh, yeah, we, we can accommodate that if, if need be. So, Okay, uh, so another question. Uh, one of the biggest problem, in my opinion, uh, with, with, with chat ops is uh, signal to noise ratio. Yep. Uh, so uh, I think that uh, what you're doing, being open, is very helpful, uh, but not necessarily at the time it's uh, happening. Uh, don't, don't you have problems with this? I mean, what I mean is uh, it's nice to go back in the history and see what was uh, being done during the pen test, but I don't need to know that right now. Uh, I mean... Maybe sometimes I do, but uh, usually I don't even know that Pentester at this particular moment is doing something. So uh, don't you have problems with uh, with having too much uh, notifications that, and, and stuff? Yeah, G good question. So, uh, I mean, most Slack-like systems do have a problem with what I would call chat dust. <laughs> You know, I mean, you basically, uh, you know, if, if it's a very chatty room and there's people in there that are quite chatty, then indeed, you know, the room can fill up with some useless, uh, stuff. 
Um, to be quite honest, in most of our actual penetration test channels, it tends to not be that, to not be that chatty. <laughs> uh, just because we have, uh, other channels in our company that are chattier. I mean, like, we've got, for example, Ross Off Topic. You know, that's like our water cooler. So if people want to post idiotic memes, that's where they go, you know? I mean, we've also got, uh, Ross Ethics, you know, which is another channel for discussing ethical concerns around certain kinds of jobs. And, you know, uh, anyway, there's a lot of different, uh, also Ross Pen Testers, which is kind of like the area just for the pen testers to ask each other questions uh, about assignments and things like that. So typically, uh, you know, we do have an explosion of chat rooms, that for sure. But uh, the only people that are actually in that chat room are the people that need to be in the chat room. <laughs> so the majority of the people actually who are on our system don't even get access to that much, <laughs> which means that there isn't quite so much to read, which means that they're not the ones typically who have the, the, the chat dust uh, problems. However, uh, we are really careful to m make it clear to people that what you write in the chat is not documentation because it just scrolls away and you're never going to find it again. So anything that you would might need to reference later or that actually you know needs to be documented documented, that needs to be done in GitLab, you know, because anything in, in Rocket Chat, that's just completely worthless. It's going to be gone, like, you know, after a day or two. Um, in terms of the customers, uh, you know, uh, are they overwhelmed, you know, by all of this? Not typically. I mean, the thing is, uh, w we can actually do, like with chat, uh, with Slack-like systems, notifications uh, for individual people. So, for example, I can do, you know, um, uh, at sign... Uh, username. And if that person is not actively logged into the chat at that moment, uh, they'll actually receive an email saying that, uh, you know, somebody on the system sent you a message. Please log in to, uh, to see what it is. Um, this actually then notifies people of actually when they need to be logged in, <laughs> which means that they actually don't need to be logged in. I mean, the nice thing about a Slack-like environment is that it keeps a backlog of the chat. So basically what you have is uh, synchronous and asynchronous communication at the same time, <laughs> which basically means that people can do other things that they need to do. They can like go to meetings or they can sleep or they can, you know, whatever, just be distracted and busy with other things. And because this backlog is maintained when they log in again that then enables them to catch up on the backlog if they want to, you know, and then, uh, you know, be able to continue basically where they left off. This is also, by the way, really useful for coordinating people across multiple time zones because I mentioned also previously that we have uh, people in Australia, but we also have people in Europe and we have you know, other places. And of course, there's the whole uh, time zone thing, <laughs> you know, and sometimes I do have, you know, one European pen tester partnered with one Australian pen tester and then the customer is, is well, probably in Europe, but, uh, you know, but sometimes they're in the, in the US. I mean, you know, sometimes we have that. Um, in that particular case, then also the asynchronous uh, nature of uh, the chat also really works in our favor uh, with that one. So no nobody has to be logged in all the time and nobody misses anything. You know, hypothetically speaking, if the chat backlog were that overwhelming, people can just say, I'm not going to read it. Just, let, you know, give me a to too long didn't read, <laughs> you know. But uh, that's basically uh, how we handle things. And for the most part, I think it's pretty doable. Anyway, thank you. I think I'm out of time. So thank you again.